Hey guys, Spencer here. Today, we're gonna to be going over one of my favorite algorithms, personally, is random forests, and also to some decision trees. But we'll be using decision trees as a base, and then just build on top of that, which is essentially what random forest is. So what are random forests? Well, I'm glad you asked, because random forests are essentially a collection of decision trees and everything within the tree world is essentially simulated from your existing data. Random forests essentially randomly selects your variables, so your y variables and your x variables as well. It plugs these in into its own decision trees based on however many trees there are, and then it will get the entire sum of how it was categorizing your data it would get the entire sum and it would average it toward the very end which is essentially a form of bagging from a very high level overview a decision tree essentially categorizes or buckets your data within certain types of categories so let's say at the very root level we have i am 15 right and then it's going to branch off to, to two different nodes uh, whether or not you are less than 15 or greater than 15 and I'll keep on categorizing these data inside of these bucket and at the very end it will tally up how much like I guess how accurate the decision tree was and then it'll essentially compare that particular tree to other trees that it generated and at the very end it will generate a Gini score Whichever score is the lowest, that is the type of tree that it will utilize at its roots. And I'll keep on doing that uh, for however many observations there are down, um, down the lane. So in this video, I will be utilizing a fraud type data set where we will be predicting based on two binary outcomes, fraud or not fraud, based on these transactions is a very popular data set I'll make sure I link that inside of the uh, description down below and without further ado let's get down to it so first things first this is where I essentially obtain the data set uh, Kaggle I'll make sure I link that into the description uh, it's essentially a credit card data set where we have a, a variety of variables that we have and we are trying to predict the class which is either denoted as a zero or a one where zero is not fraud and one is fraud. So I'll be going over this with the random forest and cart algorithm. Um, these are the required package that I'll be using uh, throughout the entire script. Uh, and I just denoted them uh, as to what type of functions or high level overview as to what these functions are uh, and how I will be using them within this script. Okay, so first and foremost, you want to make sure you clear your um you want to make sure you clear everything before you you know start progressing in your work i already done this make sure you set your directory to wherever your data lies and without further ado let's start so first things first um whenever i set my seed so that it is reproducible i just put it for like some random number it really doesn't matter as long as we have the same seeds and as long as you're following along with the same exact seed then we are good to go so I'm just going to be reading in my data set, read.csv. Uh, it'll be, I think it's called a uh, credit card, yeah, credit card, CSV. It's a sort of, of a large data set, so it'll take a few seconds to load in. Uh, once this loads in, we can do some uh, exploratory data analysis here. Okay, let's just do a string of this. So everything is numeric. This is what we are going to be predicting. Uh, we'll probably be changing this to a factor, which is essentially a categorical variable, um, and it makes it easier for our algorithm to just go through and do its thing. <laughs> Everything else seems to be a numerical variable. Let's see if there's any NAs as well. So let's do like a summary. And from what I can see, it seems like there are no null values, so we don't necessarily, yeah, we don't have to really worry about that. So this is a very clean data set, thankfully. Just because I chose this data set, I know that there's a huge, huge imbalance. Um, but anyways, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the imbalanced data set. Imbalanced data set. And this, the imbalance happens with our Y variable, uh, which is the class variable. 
and you will see so really quick let me just type in some code i'm going to be doing a table for the data at class uh, and it'll just sort of just categorize everything for us and then for our accounts that we uh, let me just print that out this is what it looks like uh, based on those counts let's do like a really quick bar plot but as you can see the discrepancy is huge it's very very imbalanced and there are ways to address this and it's via sampling essentially so let me type this in real quick cool so actually, as you can see like the magnitude is very very much off uh, just dividing like 492 and divide that by 284 807 so 0.17% um, and if we just plug in this data as it is into our model like something's bound to go wrong because 99.9% .9 of the time uh, the algorithm would just predict zero and it will be 99.9% .9 correct of the time so we don't want that to happen um, and so the way that I will address this situation is to essentially um, first we want to scale our observations and then we will use a smote algorithm and i'll go more into depth on what that is but let us uh, so we want to scale and also we want to make sure we convert the class to a factor uh, so instead of like predicting a integer where we might have like uh, decimals that are involved uh, we will essentially be uh, having like a yes or a no outcome. So let us convert the class to a factor. Get our categorical variable down there. And then we want to scale our values. And let's actually take a look. We want to scale our time. And also we want to scale the amount that we have. Everything else was already scaled for us. Um, the entire data set essentially had a principal component analysis done on it and it was a form of dimension reduction uh, i'll be going over that in a different video uh, but just for full clarity this data set is already sort of reduced if you want to call it that and already pre-scaled but uh, let us first scale the uh, the time and the amount values because they were not scaled cool so we have our dates convert oh wait not date uh, what was it data and then we have our time we want to convert that uh, yes data and convert that not class would be time convert this we should put scale right here and then do the exact same thing for the amount amount and put that right here let's run this Cool. Next, I will be loading in my handy statistical package. Uh, it's called CA Tools or Cut Tools. <laughs> uh, load that in real quick. And so, one of the functions I will be using from this is a sample.split function. Uh, so, it essentially just gets the random, it gets a random index from the number of indexes or indices that you have within your data. Uh, and it's really cool. Uh, it has the, the, um, it has the values and it has the negation of those values. So whatever values are not inside of this sequential order, uh, it, it, memori it memorizes that as well. Cool. So let's put the data in. We can we can do like an 80, 20 set. Uh, so I guess like 80% of the values. I can have that sample. We can have a training set. And then we're just gonna subset based on that data and on that split, just right here. Um, sample is equal to true. So I went ahead and I just wrote it out for the training and the testing and I just double checked the training set and your testing set and to see if they are added up correctly. So one of the ways that we could rebalance our data set is via a variety of sampling methods. One of the most popular algorithms to use to resample your data so that you have more of a equal, uh, equal chance between the frequency of your zeros and the frequencies of your ones uh, is, you, is to use a SMOTE algorithm. And that stands for the synthetic minority oversampling technique. I have I written that down, um, <laughs> but I just call it SMOTE. It's essentially a really neat algorithm to utilize undersampling and oversampling techniques. And a high level overview of the undersampling and oversampling is essentially that the undersampling is 
essentially deleting uh, the observations that it's querying or randomly picking from. And then the oversampling is that it's essentially duplicating the minority class values and it's just having more of those values to choose from. And then it's just putting that inside of your given uh, data set. So I think in terms of oversampling is for the minority class and over or an undersampling is for the majority class. So we can have like a more of an imbalance balanced data set. Now, there are some risks associated with having this imbalanced data set become balanced. First, there's like a huge, huge loss in data. And there's a lot of artificially, almost artificially generated data that is uh, conjured up as a result. And the key part here is to compare this model with other models. So in this case, I'll be comparing with logistic regressions. So we will now load in a given library. And that library is this one, DMWR. Don't ask me why that's named that because I have no idea. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we have our balanced data set. Now let's call this like bowel data train. And we have the SMOT, uh, SMOT algorithm and it has whatever parameters you want to and plug in there. Uh, so we're just gonna have our equation. It would just be class tilde with a period, just calling in all the other features. We plug in our training data set and we can have percent dot over is equal to 100. Oops, yeah. So one of the really cool and nifty ways um, that you could play around with this algorithm is that there are, come on, smokes. There are percent unders and percent overs. And this is just essentially sampling what I was discussing earlier, the sampling your minority and majority sets and creating data based on those sets. So uh, my goal is to just have it to like a one-to-one -one, uh, data set. Uh, or ratio between our classes. And this is what generates that. So let me run this real quick. And these ignore, uh, you can ignore these warning messages over here. Um, but yeah, so let's do the, again, the table. Can I write it up here? No, okay, that's fine. Uh, let's do the table of our class. And as you can see, between our zeros and our ones, they are a one-to-one -one ratio. So we are good to go. We can also take a look at what that looks like. Um, and these are the indices that the values were uh, generated from. And we have 754 zeros and 754 ones. And now, there are some additional steps that you can do before we actually get into the algorithm training with the carts and the random forests, um, but I will not be doing these particular steps uh, in order to have a more robust set. It's sort of outside of the scope of this video, but if you are curious to see how this plays a role, uh, I recommend that you follow these three steps. First step, you want to make sure that you get a correlation matrix going on, and that's with the core uh, function, the COR. Uh, and based on those COR values or the features, you wanna look at the highly correlated values between negative one and one, so whichever one is closest to those extreme values, those are the features you should be looking at because they have the most play at your predictions. Now, one of the uh, cases for each of these variables is to utilize a, um, an outlier filtering system. You can use IQR, you can use studentized residuals, you can do a bunch of other stuff. But essentially, you just want to essentially make the tails at the very end of your, I guess, normal distribution, for instance, make those tails skinnier. And that's by just eliminating the outliers. And you can do that with a variety of methods. Next, you want to make sure that you have your distribution. Um, and based on that distribution, just see if that fits what distribution you're trying to follow. Uh, in many cases, it might be normal distribution. In fact, that's more most preferable uh, to see if, you, your, if your actual data follows that of a normal distribution. Uh, but it can follow other distributions as well, just depending on that data set. So those are the three high level overview steps that you can actually do. Great, now let's first create 
um, our tree that we have going on here. The first one is going to be a decision tree. I won't be actually predicting with this decision tree because it's sort of bad and doesn't really, really like lead to a great result. But if you have many trees, which is what random forest is, you can have a lot better result. Uh, but anyways, let me load in the models or the libraries. Get the carrots, get the random forest, uh, get the E1071, which is like a really neat machine learning package. Get the R parts, which is the um, this is the carts, uh, which is essentially like the decision tree, uh, decision tree. And I think that's all of my libraries I need to load in. So let's load that in. It's already loaded. Great, cool. Now let's load in our cart model. Uh, I'm gonna call this cart model. All you do is just do R parts, which is from that library. You do the same format that you're gonna be passing it in, class tilde period. And then your data is going to be is going to come from your balanced uh, data training sets, and then we just have like a method of class, uh, capital C, I bet. Yeah, I keep on doing Control S. Anyways, uh, run this error class. Uh, yeah, it might be a lowercase. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Nothing on that end. Now let's actually plot this. Um, so we can have a par xpb is equal to na. We are going to have a plot with this, and then we're going to have a text, and then limited digits to equal three. So we can plot all of this, and this is what essentially a decision tree looks like. We have the root node, which is V14, and that's coming from that feature, V14, and then it's going to be branching off of v4 which is over here and it predicts a zero based on that and it keeps on doing this down 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 so i don't really want to go into the theoretical sense uh but this is what one tree looks like and just based on one tree you will most likely not have a very good outcome so hey guys let's cut it there uh, we went over what decision trees are not really theoretically but more so applied in the next video, we're going to figure out how to apply many decision trees all into one bundle or a forest, as you might call it. And with that forest, we're going to have even better predictions than that of a decision tree. Notice that I didn't create a, um, a testing case for our decision tree because I know it's just going to be really, really bad. It's not very great for outside data or out of the bag data when we are cons taking into consideration of different types of events and one event can vastly skew what a single tree will output. So please leave a like, make sure you comment down any questions that you might have, and please remember to subscribe and share it with your friends. So thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.